Chapter 7 of The Ghost of Kingdom Come by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. The Policeman in the Sky. My next day was spent roaming through the rooms of Storm Castle. There was so much to see books, pictures, faces, odd chairs and tables. Storm Castle was a lovely place in the daytime. I was not so sure that Storm Castle was such a lovely place at twelve o'clock at night. Midnight came all too soon. I was listening to the radio. At exactly twelve o'clock, the great Baron of Baghdad entered the room. I shut off the radio, and the Baron sat down in his chair. Baron, I said, I have put your story, The Saddest Soldier, in my book for the boys and girls to read. You really have? That's wonderful. The Baron seemed pleased. I lighted my cigar and puffed it slowly. Baron, I began, I have a really good story for you tonight. It's called The Policeman in the Sky. The Policeman in the Sky. That's a good name for a story, he replied. The Baron settled back in his chair. He looked at me through the hazy smoke of my cigar. He was waiting eagerly for me to begin. This story is about Eddie Cloud. Eddie Cloud was well named. Clouds bring trouble, darkness, rain. There was plenty of trouble, plenty of darkness, plenty of rain in Eddie's life. Yes, Eddie Cloud was well named. Eddie Cloud loved money. Even as a boy, Eddie wanted money and the things only money can buy. Eddie needed money. He stole money. Eddie stole from his mother. He stole in school. He stole from his friends. Strange as it was, no one could catch him. Of course, Eddie was clever. Before Eddie stole anything, he always planned ahead. He always planned so that nobody would catch him. If there was any danger of being caught, Eddie would not steal. Not even a penny. No, Eddie Cloud was too clever to be caught, so Eddie thought to himself. But here is the story of what happened to Eddie, who thought he was so clever. When Eddie Cloud grew up, he went to work in a bank. It was a sad day, the day Eddie began his bank job. For Eddie it seemed as though he were just next door to heaven. So much money around him. Not a little money, but piles of money, stacks of money, bushels of money. Why, they can never keep track of all this money, thought Eddie to himself. There is so much of it. If I had some of this money, I could be so happy. Eddie Cloud began to think a lot about money. Bank money, bags of money, money that did not belong to him. Eddie thought for months and months. Every night he lay awake and planned and planned and planned. Some day I shall get my chance, he would say to himself. Some day. Some day, no one will catch me. I am too clever to be caught. Finally the day did come. Eddie had his chance. Eddie took his chance. It was Saturday. Many people had been in the bank. Eddie had to work until late in the afternoon. He was alone. Thousands and thousands of dollars on all sides of him. No one would see him. This was his chance. The bank would not open again until Monday morning. By that time, Eddie could be miles away. Eddie poured some money into a bag. Hundreds of dollars. Perhaps there were thousands. He didn't stop to count the money. He hurried from the bank. Eddie was soon in an airplane. On Monday morning, there was no Eddie Cloud at the bank. The bank had been robbed. Eddie Cloud was gone. Where was Eddie on Monday morning? He was on a boat. He was somewhere on the Pacific Ocean. He was sailing for China. Everywhere policemen were trying to find Eddie Cloud. Every policeman had his picture. For months, for years, policemen searched every city, every town. There was no Eddie Cloud. It seemed as though the earth had swallowed him. Nobody knew what became of Eddie Cloud. Eddie Cloud alone knew where Eddie Cloud had gone. Far, far away from the bank, Eddie thought of how clever he had been. Nobody could catch him, thought Eddie. He had planned so well. 
He had planned so carefully. Eddie had made no mistakes. One mistake, and Eddie would have failed. One mistake, and the police would have caught Eddie quickly. When Eddie had planned to rob the bank, he had forgotten nothing. Eddie Cloud is clever. Eddie Cloud forgets nothing, thought Eddie proudly to himself. But Eddie Cloud had forgotten something. Eddie was not so clever as he thought. Eddie had made a terrible mistake. Eddie had forgotten one big thing. Here is what happened. For a short while, Eddie had a grand time with his stolen money. Then the one big thing that Eddie had forgotten began to bother him. He became terribly worried. He began to live in terrible fear. Every time Eddie saw a policeman, he was afraid. Every time there was a knock on the door, Eddie was afraid. He could not sleep at night. He could not eat. He traveled all over the world. Yet no matter where he went, Eddie found no peace. He was always afraid. Something inside Eddie, some strange voice, kept talking to him. Eddie, you have done wrong. Eddie, you have done wrong. The voice spoke to Eddie. I saw you steal the money, Eddie. You forgot that I was watching you, Eddie. Over and over again those words kept ringing in Eddie's ears. At first the voice only whispered. Then the voice spoke louder. Eddie was afraid, terribly afraid. At last Eddie Cloud could stand it no longer. Eddie went to a police station. He gave himself up to the police. With tears in his eyes he told his terrible crime. What money was left he returned to the bank. You were smart, Eddie, the policeman told him. You planned well. You forgot nothing. Oh, yes, confessed Eddie. I thought I was clever, but I wasn't clever enough. I planned not to make any mistakes, not to forget anything. But I made one big mistake. I forgot one big thing. The policeman wanted to know what Eddie had forgotten. I forgot, said Eddie sadly. I forgot the policeman in the sky. I forgot God. God is the policeman in the sky, and God sees everything. The policemen said nothing. They stared and listened as Eddie Cloud sobbed out his strange story. When I stole the money, continued Eddie, I thought nobody saw me. Nobody knew where I had gone. But the policeman in the sky, he saw me, and he caught me too. Then Eddie told the policeman about the strange voice that spoke inside his heart. It was the voice of God, the voice of the policeman in the sky whispering to him. Louder and louder the strange voice whispered until Eddie could stand it no longer. You see, said Eddie as he finished his story, I guess I am not so clever. You can't run away from the policeman in the sky. I forgot about him. That was my mistake. Say, Father Gerald, said the Baron when I finished my story. Where is Eddie Cloud now? Why, he is in prison, Baron, I answered. Eddie Cloud is an old man. Whenever anybody asked him how the police caught him, Eddie smiled sadly and answered slowly, I was caught by the policeman in the sky. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Ghost of Kingdom Come by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese The Devil Goes to Church Before coming to Storm Castle, I had never met any ghosts. I had always thought that ghosts were awful people, people who frightened you, people who chased you through the dark. Since meeting the ghosts of Storm Castle, however, I had changed my mind about ghosts. Ghosts are really very nice people. At least, the great baron of Baghdad was a nice ghost. He liked my stories. I liked him. Oh, we were getting along very well. We were having a fine time together. I had been reading when the great baron of Baghdad made a very surprising appearance. The baron was still wearing his George Washington crossing the Delaware clothes. Big broad black hat, big soldier's cape, his flashing silver sword. The baron came tramping loudly across my large room. What really frightened me was the way the Baron Ghost was waving his sword. 
He was yelling and shouting. Forward, march! Forward, march! Attention! Oh! The Baron marched right up to me and swung his sword in salute before me. He looked at me and laughed. Well, Father Gerald, how do you like my marching? That's the way we used to march in the army. Why, Baron, I gasped, you frightened me for a moment. I guessed you loved being a soldier, didn't you? Oh, yes, being a soldier is fine, but being a soldier is hard, too. Very hard sometimes. What is the hardest thing a soldier has to do? I asked the Baron. The hardest thing a soldier has to do is obey. A good soldier must obey orders. Yes, Baron, I nodded. The hardest thing for a soldier, for anybody, is to obey, to obey orders. Let me tell you a little story. You would have liked Johnny Conlon. His friends called him Jocko for short. Everybody in school liked Jocko. There wasn't a mean streak in his whole body. Good at home, good at school. Yet, Jocko was no sissy. He managed to slip into lots of trouble, but Jocko was always square. That's why everybody liked him. Jocko Conlon must have brought a great deal of happiness to his mother. Poor Mrs. Conlon had been sick for a long time. Jocko was always on the job to help her. He brought up the coal, ran errands, even dried the dishes. Many a step he saved his mother. I don't think that Jocko Conlon knew what it meant to disobey. He was Johnny on the spot whenever his mother asked him to do anything. Many mothers would have given anything to have had Jocko for their boy. Mrs. Conlon had been in bed for three weeks. It was pretty hard to have mother in bed, but never once did Jocko complain. Every night he prayed for his mother. He knew God was listening. He knew God would hear him. I know what I'll do, said Jocko to himself. I'll go right to Jesus' house and tell Jesus about my mother. When Jesus hears how sick mother is, I just know that he will hurry things along. Every night after school, Jocko went to the church. There he was alone with Jesus. Jocko liked Jesus' house. He felt that he was very close to Jesus. Every night he told Jesus about his sick mother. Every night he asked Jesus to make his mother well. As Jocko left the church one night, he met a man. He was a rough-looking man. The man gave Jocko a fierce look. Jocko was afraid. He ran all the way home. He said nothing to anybody. Sure enough, the rough-looking man was outside the church. The next night, and the next, and the next. Jocko didn't like the man. The man didn't seem to like Jocko. The man didn't speak. He just looked. That look was enough. Who can he be? What does he want? Why is he there every day? These were the questions Jocko asked himself. He wondered. Jocko kept up his visits with Jesus. Every day Jocko went to the church, and every day that terrible man was outside the church. It was Thursday. Jocko was kneeling in the church. He heard someone walk down the aisle. That someone came closer and closer. That someone stopped right where Jocko was kneeling. Jocko looked up. It was the rough-looking man. Jocko was scared. Jocko was afraid. The man wore a black coat. He laughed at Jocko. Jocko was cold. He shook all over. Then the fierce-looking man pulled back his cloak. He was dressed in red. Jocko knew who he was. He was the devil. The devil. The devil. The devil. Jocko's hair stood up straight. He screamed. He yelled. The devil laughed. What do you want? screamed Jocko. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Go away. Strange as it may seem, the devil was nice to Jocko. He told Jocko not to be afraid. He promised not to touch Jocko. I have watched you for days, said the devil. I have followed you. You seem to be a pretty good boy. Maybe you think that you are better than I am. I am better, cried Jocko. I am better. I want to be better, much better than you. The devil laughed. He laughed out loud. You would never think that he was in God's house. I am just as good as you are, boasted the devil. I can do everything that you can do. In fact, I can do some things better. You have to eat, and I never eat. 
You have to sleep, but I never sleep. You have friends, but not as many friends as I have. You play a little, but I play all the time. Why, I can do anything that you can do. Then the devil stopped. He seemed to be thinking. He hung his head. No, Jocko, I'm wrong, said the devil. I have made a mistake. There is one thing that I find pretty hard to do. It's the one thing in which you beat me. What is it? What is it? asked Jocko. The devil waited. He spoke. I find it hard to obey. I hate to obey anybody. Then the devil hurried off. He was gone. Never again did Jocko see the devil. Never again did the devil go into the church. He was gone. Gone forever. It was a happy Jocko Conlon who left the church that day. All the way home he seemed to walk on air. I'm better than the devil. I'm better than the devil. Over and over Jocko sang those words to himself. I'm better than the devil. I'm better than the devil because I obey. The devil, said the baron, could never be a soldier. But little Jocko Conlon would make a fine soldier. Jocko Conlon knows how to obey. Yes, Baron, I insisted. Everybody in this world must obey. Everybody. Pardon me, Father Gerald, the Baron interrupted. I must be going. What is the matter, Baron? I asked with surprise. You seem to be in a hurry. Well, Father Gerald, the Baron was smiling. St. Peter told me to get back to heaven a little earlier. He thinks I am staying out too late these nights. I must obey St. Peter, Father Gerald. You know, St. Peter is mighty important up in heaven, just like a general in the army. The ghost baron was gone. I laughed to myself when I thought that even up in heaven, people must obey orders. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Ghost of Kingdom Come by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Buns and Fish The great Baron of Baghdad arrived very early the next evening. You have come early tonight, Baron, I said. Yes, Father Gerald, he laughed. I want to keep on the right side of St. Peter. Baron, I don't think that you like St. Peter. Oh, I guess it will be all right when we get to know each other better, the ghost answered with a laugh. Yes, Baron, I suppose so, I agreed. Really, St. Peter is a fine person. Remember, our Lord liked Peter a lot. And speaking about St. Peter, let me tell you a good story about him. I call this story Buns and Fish. When our Lord lived on this earth a long time ago, he was very, very famous. He was famous because he did so many wonderful things. He cured the sick. He gave sight to blind people. He made deaf people hear. He made crippled people walk again. And best of all, Jesus made dead people live again. No wonder everybody called our Lord the Wonder Worker. Why, Jesus did so many wonderful things that everywhere he went, people went to see him. Crowds of people would follow Jesus from town to town. Everybody wanted to be with Jesus. Now the hero of this story was a little boy called Mark. Mark lived in a little town away up in the country. Mark, too, had heard about the great Jesus. Many times little Mark had listened to the big people as they told stories about our Lord. How Jesus had changed water into wine at a wedding party. How Jesus had made a storm at sea stop by just speaking to the wind and the waves. The more Mark heard about Jesus, the more he wanted to see Jesus. Then one night everybody became excited. The whole town was stirred with news. The great wonder worker was coming to town. Tomorrow Jesus would be in town. Little Mark hardly slept that night. He was so excited. Mark was up very early the next morning. He was going to meet Jesus. Then Mark had an idea. Mother, he said, give me a lunch to take with me today. Then I won't have to come home to eat. Mark's mother was puzzled. Why don't you want to eat at home? Well, he explained, if I have to come home for dinner, I might miss some of the wonderful things Jesus will do. I don't want to miss anything. 
I want to stay with Jesus just as long as I can. Mark's mother fixed him his lunch. Two little fish, two very small fish, like the sardines we have in cans and eat on Friday. There were also five little buns, buns and fish. That was Mark's lunch. His mother put the lunch in a little box. Mark tucked the box under his arm and ran up the road. Little Mark was off to meet Jesus. Mark didn't wait for Jesus to come to town. Oh, no. Mark walked out into the country to meet Jesus. There was a crowd with Jesus. Mark joined the crowd. They walked and walked and walked. People came out of their houses. People stood on the side of the road. Some people clapped. Jesus smiled. Jesus stopped to talk. Everybody listened. Mark tried to get up close, but an old man with whiskers chased him away. Mark tried again and again. The old man chased him. Mark certainly liked Jesus, but he didn't like the old man with the whiskers. Some other children tried to get close to Jesus. They were chased, too. Then Jesus turned to the old man with the whiskers. Peter, Peter, don't chase them away. Let the little children come to me. Don't you know that heaven is filled with children? Mark listened. So his name is Peter. Well, Peter may be a pretty good name, said Mark to himself, but just the same, I don't like him. The day was hot. The crowd was large. All of the sick people of the town were brought to Jesus. Mark watched to see what would happen. Right before his eyes, Mark saw Jesus make a blind man see. He was the old blind man who Mark had often helped to cross the street. Why, when Mark saw Jesus do that, his eyes popped with surprise. What wonderful things Jesus could do. Jesus was a wonder worker, all right. After a while, Mark became hungry. Oh boy, I was smart, said Mark to himself. I brought my lunch. I guess I won't eat it, though, until I get terribly hungry. The longer I put off eating, the longer I can stay with Jesus. I'll save my lunch for a while. I'm going to stay with Jesus just as long as I can. Mark held tightly to his little tin box. He opened it once, twice, three times. Mark liked fish and buns, but he did not eat. Finally, Jesus began to talk to the people. Mark did not understand what Jesus was saying, but he sat still and listened. The man called Peter might box his ears if he made any noise while Jesus was speaking. When Jesus stopped talking, it was very late. It was evening. Would the people go home now? Would Jesus go away? Mark wondered. Jesus looked over the crowd. There must have been 5,000 people sitting on the ground. Everybody was watching Jesus to see what he would do next. Jesus whispered something to Peter. Then Mark's heart jumped. He saw Jesus looking at him. Worse yet, Peter was pointing his finger at Mark and talking to Jesus. Mark was afraid. Mark was scared. What was Peter going to do to him? Maybe he was going to lick him. Now, what Peter did not know was this. Jesus was telling Peter that the people looked terribly hungry. Some of them were far from home. Jesus was asking Peter if anybody in the crowd had anything to eat. Peter told Jesus that nobody in the crowd had any food except one little boy. The little boy had a small tin box of food. But that, Peter told Jesus, was not enough for 5,000 people. Mark kept watching Jesus and Peter. Then Mark became terribly frightened. Peter started for Mark. Mark jumped to his feet. Peter was after him. Mark tried to run, but there were too many people in his way. He was caught. Caught by Peter. Caught by the old man with the whiskers. Mark screamed. He yelled. He hollered. Peter caught him by the arm. Before he knew it, Mark was standing before Jesus. Sonny, asked Jesus, what's in that little tin box? It's my lunch, my lunch, my buns and fish. Please let me go, please let me go. Don't be afraid, said Jesus to Mark. No one will harm you. No one will hurt you. Then Jesus put his hand on Mark's shoulder. Mark felt better. The old man with the whiskers smiled. Would you give me your lunch? Our Lord asked Mark. Everybody was watching. Everybody was listening. Mark held out his lunchbox to Jesus. 
oh sure lord little mark was so excited he could hardly talk here you may have my lunch there isn't very much here if you come to my house my mother will give you more jesus smiled and took mark's box he made mark sit down beside him mark looked at peter peter could not chase him now mark had given his lunch box to jesus jesus waited he opened mark's box jesus took out the fish he held the buns in his hand not very much thought mark to give to jesus mark wished he had brought more lunch jesus blessed the buns and the fish in the wink of an eye there were hundreds of fish there were thousands of buns jesus did it so quickly that mark's eyes almost popped out of his head mark never saw so many fish in all his life never before had he seen so many buns mark had seen with his own eyes he knew that jesus had power this was the greatest thing that jesus had done all day everybody ate the buns and fish it was just like a picnic plenty for everybody why there was even too much when the picnic was over there were twelve baskets of food that had not been touched jesus had fed over five thousand people out of mark's little lunch box when mark went home that night he was very proud he had helped jesus do something great he had helped jesus feed five thousand people with his five little buns and his two little fish mark never forgot that wonderful day he spent with jesus and here is something funny some people say that when mark grew up he became a great friend of peter they say too that peter and mark traveled all over the world together telling everybody about jesus say father gerald wrote the great baron of baghdad jesus certainly liked children didn't he oh yes baron i replied i often think of little mark's giving his lunch-box to jesus if i were a painter i would paint a picture of just how i think it happened how is that the ghost baron asked well baron just think of that crowd of five thousand people all kinds of people rich men like bankers and storekeepers powerful men like soldiers smart men very smart men like doctors lawyers and school teachers little mark's school teacher he was there too all these people were mighty important nobody paid any attention to poor little mark but when jesus wanted somebody to help him do something wonderful what did he do did jesus ask help from the important people oh no jesus didn't ask the rich men for any help jesus didn't ask the smart men for any help when jesus wanted to do something big when jesus wanted help he called up little mark now baron i continued that is why i think that jesus doesn't really care how rich we are or how powerful we are or how smart we are what jesus really cares about is this jesus wants people to love him if people will give jesus the best they have even though it isn't very much like mark in his lunch box then i know jesus will bless them End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Ghost of Kingdom Come by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Peter Rugg A storm blew up the next afternoon. By nightfall, the wind and rain were whipping Storm Castle with all their might. When the ghost baron of Bagnet arrived, I noticed that his clothes were not wet. There was no mud on his boots. The storm doesn't seem to bother you, Baron, I said. You are not a bit wet. Oh, no, Father Gerald, the ghost laughed. Storms don't bother ghosts. In fact, I love storms. As the Baron was removing his coat and hat, there was a brilliant flash of lightning, then a terrible crack of thunder. Peter Rugg must be writing tonight, I whispered. Peter Rugg? Who is he? why baron i explained on stormy nights mothers in this part of the country gather their children around the fire and tell them the story of peter rugg for eighty years poor peter rugg has been driving up and down the roads of boston always always looking for boston he drives the same horses his little girl rides with him when peter passes he is followed by a terrible storm always looking for the road to boston as yet Peter Rugg has not found the road to Boston. The ghost baron insisted that I tell him this strange tale. 
the thunder continued to roar. I had to talk louder than usual. When first I heard the strange story of Peter Rugg, I did not think it was true. But the story of Peter Rugg is true. I have seen Peter Rugg. I have seen his little girl. One night I met them on a lonely country road. They passed me again one afternoon. I waved to them, but they would not stop. Many times at night I have heard their carriage pass my house. It was Peter Rugg and his daughter all right, because the earth shook and the house trembled as they passed. Many times have I prayed for Peter Rugg and his little girl. Peter Rugg, it seems, lived in Boston long ago. He had one little girl. I have never heard the name of the little girl, but that does not matter. Peter had one bad habit. Peter had a terrible temper. Let anyone disagree with Peter Rugg, and he swore, he cursed, he called people bad names. It was a terrible thing to see Peter mad. Many a chair did he break, many a table did he harm in his fits of anger. Little boys were afraid of him, little girls kept away from him. It was in the spring. Peter Rugg hitched up his horses. He drove his daughter to a nearby town to visit some friends. By the time Peter and his little girl were ready to start for home, a terrible storm had arisen. Rain, thunder, lightning, fierce lightning, terrible lightning. His friends begged Peter to stay with them for the night. They begged Peter and his little girl not to start home in the terrible storm. But Peter was stubborn. The storm made Peter very angry. He swore. He said bad words. Why, he even called God names. Let it rain cried Peter. Let it rain. Let it thunder. Let it lightning. Nothing can stop me. I'm going to Boston, and I'll be in Boston tonight. Not even God can stop me from being in Boston tonight. Peter climbed into his carriage. His daughter sat beside him. They drove away, out into the rain and the thunder and the lightning. They drove and drove and drove. But Peter Rugg did not reach home that night. Peter Rugg did not reach home the next night, nor the next night. Peter Rugg and his little girl are still driving. They are not home yet. Where is Peter Rugg? Peter Rugg is still looking for the road to Boston. For over eighty years, Peter Rugg has driven all over this country. He is still looking for the road to Boston. Many, many times he has been very near his home. Again, he has been far away. People have met him in New York. I passed him in Virginia. Always, 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 Peter Rugg is looking for the road to Boston. Nobody knows where Peter sleeps. Nobody has ever seen him eat. He travels in the spring, the summer, the fall, the winter, always looking for the road to Boston. You may meet him in the middle of the night. You may meet him in the middle of the day. When you do meet him, you will surely know him, because he will ask you this question. Which is the road to Boston? The Baron interrupted with a question. God is punishing Peter Rugg because he swore so much. Is that it? Yes, Baron, I answered. I think that is what God is doing, punishing Peter Rugg for swearing. It is a sad thing to meet Peter Rugg. He drives his black horses. His little girl sits by his side. As his carriage rolls along, it shakes the earth. Wherever Peter goes, he is followed by rain, thunder, and lightning. Poor Peter Rugg, spoke the Baron sadly. I feel sorry for him. When I lived on earth, I, too, had a terrible temper. I swore a great deal. You did, Baron? I was quite surprised. Yes, Father Gerald, the ghost replied. But God punished me, too. How? I asked. Well, Father Gerald, the ghost spoke slowly. If you ever tell any of your friends about me, Tell them that because of my bad temper and my bad language, God made me stay in purgatory for years. The Baron paused for a moment. I wondered if he would continue. He prepared to leave. As he was about to open the door, he turned and faced me. Father Gerald, said the ghost, if you ever meet Peter Rugg again, please stop him, please. Ask him to get down on his knees and beg God's pardon. I know that God will forgive him. If Peter Rugg will beg God's pardon, I know that God will show Peter Rugg the road to Boston. With that, the ghost disappeared into the night. End of chapter 10
Chapter 11 of The Ghost of Kingdom Come by Rev. Jared T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Calling Up the King. I had finished my supper. I was reading a book. The phone rang and I answered. It was my friend, the ghost. At the sound of his voice, I trembled. Who ever heard of talking with a ghost on the phone? But that's just what I did. I talked on the telephone with the great Baron of Baghdad. The Baron phoned to tell me that he would be late. A ghost on the telephone! That was something. My ghost friend, the Baron, arrived shortly after midnight. I didn't know. I greeted him. That ghosts talk on telephones. Aha, Father Gerald, he laughed. I'll bet you were surprised to hear my voice over the telephone. When I lived on Earth, about 150 years ago, there were no telephones. Now I have lots of fun using telephones. Speaking of telephones, Baron, I told him, you have given me an idea for tonight's story. What is it? the ghost Baron asked. The name of this story is Calling Up the King. The clock struck 12.30. I began my story. Far away in the country of Denmark, there lives a good king the King of Denmark. People say nice things about the King of Denmark. The reason, I guess, why everybody likes the King of Denmark is because he is different from other kings. Some kings, you know, spend all their time sitting on golden thrones. They always wear crowns of gold and beautiful red cloaks. But not the King of Denmark. No, he spends his time helping the poor. The King of Denmark visits the sick. Why, he even visits the schools because he loves little boys and girls. Really, you would never think that the king of Denmark was a king. Why, he even dresses like all the other people. He goes about the streets like everybody else. Sometimes he rides his horse. Sometimes he walks. The king talks with everybody. Do you know that the king of Denmark even puts the number of his telephone in the telephone book? That makes the king of Denmark different from every other king in the world. The king of England, the king of Italy, every king in the world has a telephone. They have lots of telephones. Some of them have gold telephones. But these kings never put the number of their phones in the telephone book. They don't want to be bothered. They are afraid that people might call them on the phone when they are asleep. These kings feel that they are too important to be bothered. But not the king of Denmark. No, sir. The king of Denmark puts his name and the number of his phone in the telephone book, just as all the other people do. Anyone may phone to the king of Denmark. No wonder that the people of Denmark love their king. No wonder that all the mothers in Denmark tell their children about the king. No wonder that Mrs. Dyke told such lovely stories about the king to her little boy Carl. Yes, Carl had heard so many fine things about the king. Carl longed for the day when he would be big enough to go to the square to see the king. Carl was eight years old. He loved school. He loved books. He loved to read. Carl was in the second grade when his mother showed him the king's name in the telephone book. That pleased Carl so much. He could read the king's name. One day, Carl's mother went to visit his aunt. Carl was left alone in the house. It was raining. He played with his blocks. He played with his dog. Then Carl had a grand idea. I know what I'll do, said Carl to himself. I'll call up the king. And that's just what Carl did. It took him a long time to find the king's name in the telephone book. But there it was, written in big letters. He read, King of Denmark, Royal 8000. Royal 8000, said Carl to the lady over the phone. Carl waited. He listened. Sure enough, pretty soon Carl heard the king talk. At first Carl was nervous, but the king was very nice to him. Carl said to the king, My name is Carl. I am eight years old, and I go to school. Then Carl told the king about his mother and sick aunt. You are a good little boy, said the king. You have made me very happy. It was nice of you to call me on the phone. I hope that some day I shall be able to make you very happy. Be a good boy, Carl, and may God bless you. It took Carl Dyke a long time to get to sleep that night. Carl was so happy, happy because he had talked with the king. But that isn't all. Three days later, the postman gave Mrs. Dyke a large package. It was for Master Carl Dyke. 
Carl opened the package himself. What do you think was in the package? A picture, a picture of the king, a picture of the king of Denmark. Across the bottom of the picture were written these words, To my little friend Carl, from the king of Denmark. Carl put the picture in his room. He hung it on the wall. It was the first thing he saw every morning. It was the last thing he saw every night. Carl was proud that he had the king of Denmark for a friend, proud that he had the king's picture. Nor is that all. Three months later, Mrs. Dyke answered the phone. A man wanted to talk to Carl. Yes, it was the king. You haven't called me in a long time, said the king, so I called you. For five long minutes, little Carl Dyke talked again with the king of Denmark. Many times afterward, Carl and the king talked on the phone. They became real friends, little Carl Dyke and the king of Denmark. Baron, I said when I had finished, do you know why I like to tell this story to boys and girls? Why, Father Gerald? the ghost asked. Because, I explained, I'd like to show boys and girls how they, too, like little Carl, have a king. Jesus up in heaven is our king, the king of heaven. We, too, can talk with our king any time we wish. Every time we pray, we talk to our king, just as Carl talked to the king of Denmark on the telephone. The best part of all is that the king of heaven is always listening when we call. Praying to Jesus is just like calling Jesus on the telephone. Praying to Jesus is just like making a long-distance telephone call to the king of heaven. Long-distance telephone call? The ghost seemed puzzled. How far can you talk on those telephones, Father Gerald? Why, Baron, as far as you wish, I boasted. I can sit right in this room and talk over the telephone to any place in the world. Even to Denmark? The ghost seemed excited. Certainly, Baron, that would be easy. I had made a terrible mistake in telling the Baron the wonders of the telephone. Father Gerald, he asked, will you let me use your telephone? I want to make a long-distance call to Denmark. Please, Father Gerald. To Denmark, I gasped with surprise. Yes, Father Gerald, my ghost friend was begging. I want to call up the King of Denmark. After a long time, I succeeded in showing the ghost why he should not call up the King of Denmark. It would cost so much money, and a lot of other things, I told him. At last the ghost, Baron of Baghdad, left, and very sad he was, too. I was alone. I knelt down and made a long-distance call to the King of Heaven. I prayed that the ghost would forget all about telephones. But all night I was troubled with a terrible dream. In my dream, all the telephone bells in the world kept ringing, ringing, ringing. My friend, the ghost of Baghdad, was making them ring. End of chapter 11